I had another meeting last week in Illinois, and I asked hospital administrators, doctors, nurses, pediatricians, those who are in the substance abuse treatment area, what they thought of the Republican bill, it was all Republicans, who passed the health care uh, finance act, whatever the name of it is, their version of the health uh, care uh, system that they're calling for reform in the House of Representatives. It's interesting. They were unanimously opposed to it, all of them. Hospital administrators, doctors, nurses, pediatricians, across the board. Why would all the medical providers in my state be opposed to the Republican plan that just passed the House of Representatives? Well, because they've read it. And here's what they found. It threatens the survival of downstate and inner city hospitals. The Illinois Hospital Association came out against the Republican plan and said that we could lose 60,000 jobs in Illinois. And we could see cutbacks in services in our hospitals. I know the presiding officer from the state of Oklahoma knows what rural hospitals mean to these small towns. It is not only life and death to have access to quality health care, they're some of the best paying jobs in town. And the thought that those hospitals are going to see services cut back, people laid off, is worth sitting up and taking notice. And they also are worried because the Congressional Budget Office never gave an analysis of the Republican plan that passed the House of Representatives. That is unheard of. When we passed the Affordable Care Act in the United States Senate, we waited week after weary week for the Congressional Budget Office to analyze each of the major changes. We didn't want to make a mistake. And we felt obligated to tell the American people what we were doing to the health care system, which is one-sixth of the national economy. Somehow, the Republican leaders in the House of Representatives paid no attention to that and passed a bill without a Congressional Budget Office analysis. Possibly it's because the first version of that bill, which was analyzed by the CBO, found that it was devastating. 24 million Americans would lose their health insurance under the Republican plan in its first phase. 24 million Americans lose their health insurance. In Illinois, 1 million people, state of 12 and a half million people, 1 million people living in my state would have lost their health insurance coverage by the plan proposed initially by the Republicans in the House. And we also know that it would shorten the lifespan of Medicare, for one thing. And we know that it allowed for waivers by governors to eliminate what they called non-essential services in health insurance. One of them hits close to home. I can remember as a new senator here coming to the floor and watching Paul Wellstone, who used to be at that desk, and Pete Domenici, who used to be at that desk, get up on a bipartisan basis and argue again and again that every health insurance plan in America should cover mental illness and substance abuse treatment. It seems so obvious, and yet, they had to fight the insurance industry for years before we finally achieved it. Now, when you buy health insurance in America, it covers mental illness and substance abuse treatment. Thank goodness. We need it. We desperately need it. And yet that becomes one of the non-essential elements in the Republican analysis of health insurance. What are they thinking? Have they listened or read recently about the opioid and heroin crisis in America? I've sat at tables with victims, addicts who, thank goodness, had an intervention and had an opportunity and now can speak of their addiction in the past tense. These are amazing young people whose lives were compromised and threatened because of addiction. How did they turn the corner? They turned the corner because of loving families, their personal determination, and the availability of medical treatment under their health insurance plans. Now the Republicans are arguing in the House of Representatives, we don't need that coverage, we don't need that protection. We do now more than ever. And when I hear the Republican leader come to the floor and criticize the Affordable Care Act, I basically have to ask him, is this a problem that is of your own creation? The Republicans, including the leader, have refused to sit down with Democrats and work on a bipartisan solution. In fact, when the Republican leaders sat down to determine how the Senate would respond to the House action, he put together a group of, I believe, 12 Republican senators, no Democrats allowed, 
to sit down and write the alternative. That's not a good way to start this. What we ought to do is to say first, we're not going to repeal the Affordable Care Act, we're going to improve it. And we'll do it on a bipartisan basis. If the majority leader wants to suggest that, I'd like to be part of it. Many Democrats would like to be part of it. Take repeal off the table before the conversation on repair begins. I think that's essential. Let's make sure that within health insurance in America, we have some basics. First, if you have a pre-existing condition, you shouldn't be disqualified from health insurance, or you shouldn't have to pay twice the premiums. That's something that's built into the law now, the law that the Republicans want to repeal. Well, I want to make sure that pre-existing conditions are protected. I've said on the floor before that a couple weeks ago I had a heart procedure, a catheter procedure, an outpatient procedure. Apparently it worked pretty well. I'm standing here talking to you today. I feel good. But a lot of people go through this. I became a statistic the day that happened. I now, I guess, have a pre-existing condition. So be it. One out of three Americans fit that category. Why would we not protect them in any health insurance reform bill? That seems like the starting point in our conversation. And yet the bill that passed the House, the Republican bill that passed the House, allows governors to basically ask for waivers so that health insurance plans in their state won't cover people with pre-existing conditions or allow people with those conditions to have the same premiums. That is not a good starting place. It's a terrible starting place. Let's try to make sure that if we are going to move forward on real health care reform, we do it in a sensible fashion. Let's put together a bill, not like the one that passed the House, but put together a bill that has the support of hospital administrators across the nation. Let's put together a bill that protects the Medicaid expansion that's part of the Affordable Care Act. Medicaid is an essential part of health insurance in America for tens of millions of people. Medicaid, most people think, oh, that's health insurance for poor people. Really, that's not a, an accurate description. Medicaid, for example, in the state of Illinois, provides health coverage for half of the children who are born in my state. Prenatal care, postnatal care, and the actual delivery of half of the children in my state under Medicaid. That's not the most expensive part of Medicaid, the most expensive part in my state and across the nation is the fact that Medicaid is there to help your mother and your grandmother, your dad and your grandfather, when they're in a situation in life where they need a helping hand. They may be in an assisted care facility. Social Security check is not enough. Medicare is not enough. Medicaid steps in to make sure that they have the quality care they need. Are we going to eliminate that kind of coverage and protection? Ask disabled people. Ask the organizations that represent them what it means to have a good, strong Medicaid system. These people rely on Medicaid for maintaining their health through disability day in and day out. So when the Republicans propose an $840 billion cut in Medicaid protection across America over 10 years, then sadly they are setting out in a, in a path or on a path that could compromise the basic care we need for babies and new moms, for the elderly in assisted care facilities and nursing facilities, for the disabled who live in our states. We don't want to see that happen. It's interesting. My Republican governor in the state of Illinois seldom comments on federal legislation. He came out in opposition to the bill that passed the House of Representatives. He said this is a significantly bad bill for the state of Illinois, and I agree with him. I'm glad he spoke up. I don't know how the seven Republican congressmen who voted for it from my state can ignore that reality. Our governor, our Republican governor, believes it's bad for our state in cutting back Medicaid. The hospitals believe it's bad for our state and the impact it'll have on downstate hospitals. The doctors and the nurses and the pediatricians also oppose it. So what can we do? What should we do? Well, first, we ought to try to see what we can do to make the Affordable Care Act work better. We can do that on a bipartisan basis. We want to make sure, as the senator from Kentucky said earlier, that there are available, uh, available health insurance programs in every county of every state. One thing we can do, certainly, is to make sure that a public option is there for everyone if they choose it. 
something that looks like Medicare. People respect Medicare. Medicare is a great program for millions of Americans who are seniors and disabled. Why wouldn't we create a program like Medicare, a not-for-profit, government-operated program like Medicare for people who wish it? Those who don't can stick with private insurance if that's their choice. But I believe you'll find more and more people moving toward the Medicare option. That's something I'd like to put on the table in reforming the Affordable Care Act. Secondly, we need to address the cost of pharmaceuticals and drugs in America. The cost is out of control. This uh, week I received publication from the AARP, the American Association of Retired Persons, and they talked about what's happening to pharmaceutical prices across America. You don't have to tell seniors and most Americans who are buying prescription drugs what the reality happens to be. Let me give you a few numbers to demonstrate why we need to have a new program to make sure that drug prices don't go out of control. Americans spent $457 billion on prescription drugs in 2015, according to AARP, up about 8% over the previous year, $457 billion. <clears throat> the rise in prices for the most popular brand name drugs from 2008 to 2016, over 200%. They more than doubled in that eight-year period of time for the most popular drugs. <clears throat> the median salary of a pharmaceutical firm CEO in 2015, $14.5 million, more than any other industry. $6.4 billion, that's the amount drug companies spent advertising directly to consumers in the U.S. annually. $24 billion, the amount drug companies spend per year marketing to doctors. We are one of only two nations in the world that allow direct-to-consumer advertising. Think about what that means. When you see all these ads on televisions for drugs with names you can't pronounce, why are they doing it? It's because the drug companies know that consumers across America will write down the name of the drug and go ask the doctor to prescribe it. And many times, the doctor, rather than debate the issue with a patient or suggest they don't need it or should use a generic, just write out the script. And what happens? Expensive drugs, more expensive drugs get into the system, raising the cost of health care, raising the cost of premiums for health insurance. It doesn't make us healthier. It just means health care is more expensive. One of my favorite drugs, I love to listen to the warnings on these drugs that go on and on and on. One of my favorites was, be sure and tell your doctor if you have had a liver transplant. <sighs> Thinking to myself, yeah, I think I would probably mention that somewhere along the way to a doctor. But these warnings should give us fair warning that this is inflating the cost of health care across America. It's not making us healthier, and it's running up profits dramatically for pharmaceutical companies. Why is it the same drugs, exactly the same drugs made in the United States, sell for a fraction of their cost in America in places like Canada and in Europe? It's a legitimate question. We ought to address it. Do we have the political nerve to do it? I hope so. It should be part of affordable care reform. I hope that we sit down and do something on a bipartisan basis to deal with the challenges we face. But first, take repeal off the table. Let's make the Affordable Care Act stronger. Let's do it on a bipartisan basis. Let's set out to come up with a, a solution that doesn't do what the House version did, which could eliminate health insurance for millions of people across America and a million people in my state of Illinois.